my non-American viewers who understand that the world does not consist only of a single nation sailing across an infinite sea of Mexican migrant workers will no doubt have heard that the water around Brisbane got sick of waiting for people to come hit the beach and decided to bring the party to us. I don't keep up with the news though, so it was only when I emerged blinking from my grotto and saw that the sandbag fairy had visited all the good little shop doorways that I found out that the central business district had flooded. First thought, oh cock, all the nearest game retailers are in the CBD because some retarded pile of cartilage on the town planning department thought it would be a great idea to put 30 EB game shops within the same 10 square yards. Second thought, oh balls, with humanitarian aid selfishly obstructing the delivery services, I won't be seeing any of my imports anytime soon either. Third thought, oh goody, that means I can go back inside and keep playing Minecraft. I have to admit, I'm surprised that The Sims 3 even exists, considering that EA's usual policy of releasing a new fraction of a game every time the cocaine bucket runs dry seem to be serving them perfectly well. But I guess even Sims fans occasionally demand something more every now and again when they're not drinking Bacardi breezes and having periods. I know what you're thinking, Yahtzee, you inappropriate menstruation joke. Why the reluctance? The Sims is more popular than a chocolate cunnilingus machine and afterwards doesn't make you feel fat and ashamed. It's introduced millions of people to gaming and has made enough money to buy a lap dance for every depressive in the Western world. For this exercise, assume that you are the president of The Sims fan club. Well, I could say that the majority of its audience are casual gamers, pronouncing casual gamers the same way I pronounce the word tapeworms, but that argument's a wee bit no true Scotsman. Truly my objection comes because what I am is a critic of games, not a critic of computer programs that you just fuck around in. I figure it's time for a rundown of the candidates now that all three have at the very least made some kind of awkward stammering announcement of their console. So far it's been like watching the most retarded game of Texas Hold'em ever played, where everyone just sat and eyeballed each other for six months before someone finally called in the most weaselly non-committed way possible in the hopes it would make someone else show their hand. Whereupon the flop cards were revealed to be a Joker, a Get Out of Jail Free, and a Mages of the Vineyard from Magic the Gathering. Of course the odd man out is Nintendo as ever, and keeping with the poker metaphor they were dealt a pair of twos right at the start and immediately went all in motherfuckers, only to realise later that one of the two was actually a 4 that had been partially covered by a big fat touchscreen controller someone had left on the table. When I said that all the cars in GTA 4 handled like there's a fat baby attached to the steering wheel, they brought out the Lost and Damned, which centred around a motorcycle gang. But that was even worse, because characters in GTA always seem to hold onto motorbikes as loosely as possible in case they catch crotch rot from the seats, and the graphics are so murky that riding down a busy road at high speed is making a foolish wager with the quintuple somersault head injury fairy. Alright then, said Rockstar, here's the Ballad of Gay Tony, where every other mission is helicopter based, but the helicopters handle worst of all. It's like he's constantly airlifting a fucking merry-go-round with a hippo on one side. Alright then, motherfucker, says Rockstar, let's just set GTA 100 years ago so you don't have to drive motorised vehicles at all, are you happy now? To which I reply, my horse appears to be lodged in a wall. Electronic Arts. 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 If there was ever a name that illustrated a need for some kind of verbal equivalent of social services who come and forcibly take words away if they're being misused, then again they do mainly go by EA these days so maybe they quietly change their name to extruding assholes so as not to offend reality. <laughs> Nitpicking is unhelpful, however, and I'm in the kind of mood that I'm prepared to overlook a lot of flaws in Skyrim, which is good because there are a lot of flaws in Skyrim, but I'll applaud it if it means we can have less games that treat me like a child stuck in a pipe games industry. I will applaud it as hard as you like. I will slap at my palms until my future children suffer masturbation guilt. No, I don't know what I'm on about. Go away. Spunk on a bap. I've been playing so many sandbox games lately, my vagina feels like a rusty toaster. If there's one thing history has taught us besides not to piss off people called Genghis or put lead in your water pipes, it's that if you're going to make something incredibly good that becomes frighteningly popular, make sure it's the last thing you ever make in your entire life, because otherwise you get to spend the rest of your creative career struggling under the weight of high expectations and bricks. Will Wright created The Sims, a franchise which by shrewdly combining user-designed assets, the powers of a malevolent trickster god, and a massive amount of implied nudity now annually makes about twice as much money as Belgium. So can his new game, Spore, possibly live up to that legacy? In short, no. In long, no. You know what, I'm glad that new releases are currently barer than the sandwich platter at the home for wayward fat people. I've caught up on so much shit. I finished my full-size replica of the West Midlands in Minecraft at the bottom of the ocean where it belongs, and I've caught up on some of last year's releases that I missed the first time around. I picked up Battlefield 4, then I put it down again and stamped on it a few times, and then I picked up the new Zelda, Link Between Worlds, instead. Now if you're looking for a balanced and thoughtful critique of the game, then what the fuck are you doing here? I'm basically just gonna rail it with the same point as always until it cries. <laughs> The next step was to find a gun, something all my peers never seem to have any difficulty with, but after moving inland a bit and exploring a convenient city, I found a fucking treasure pile of ordnance at the top of a stairwell in a three-story building, including a rifle, a pistol, and ammo to spare. Blimey, I thought this game was unforgiving, I thought. I wonder where all this came from. Maybe it belonged to this dead player over here. Hey, why are all the windows broken? And then I was shot by a sniper. 
It's difficult to pin down my favourite aspect of Duke Nukem Forever between the dolphin races and the gun that shoots dogs and the liberal use of full frontal nudity, but I think the achievements deserve particular mention. It's not just the usual token achievement every time you beat a chapter and a big one at the end. No, sir, Duke Nukem Forever makes you fucking work for your gamer score. There's the achievement for beating the final boss using only your ears. There's the achievement for playing the whole game with the controller immersed in icy water. The achievement for placing a Wii Fit board in front of the TV and obliterating it with a croquet mallet. But the hardest one of all is the achievement for turning off the console, leaving the house, meeting a nice girl, taking a sailing boat around the world, having three beautiful blonde children, and finally dying content with the knowledge that we didn't spend 12 years waiting for an utterly pedestrian sequel to a game that everyone stopped caring about around 1997 to be released by a developer that makes John Romero look on the ball. Which is a huge challenge, because if just one of those kids turns out brunette, then you have to start all over again. So with Fisher-Price Shoggoth scratching at my walls, I decided the sensible level-headed thing to do would be to tunnel down into the centre of the earth. Perhaps there, thought I, I would find the point to all this. Well, after wearing out more picks than Jimi Hendrix on a caffeine drip, I found a fair amount of iron, enough coal to black up the entire Ku Klux Klan, and three lava flows, every single one of which I fell into and lost all my items. Christ, this is like Zelda meets There Will Be Blood. But just before I hit bedrock, I finally found some gold, which I immediately crafted into a sword and armour set. Ha, this will give a hedge pause for thought before it kamikazes me. But shortly afterwards, I discovered that Minecraft goes for the realistic portrayal of gold in that it's slightly less sturdy than the tin foil around a baked potato. So that was my net profit from the operation, 50 chests full of rocks, a big fuck off hole and some slightly tasteless evening wear. Quite a few third party games to get through now, so let's keep it snappy. Assassin's Creed 2! A while ago, the idea got around that Assassin's Creed 2 would be set in the future, like what Assassin's Creed 1 was foreshadowing, but it seems Ubisoft feel that too much innovation all in one go will cause people's heads to explode. So we've instead moved from ancient history to slightly less ancient history. Thank God for that, I was almost getting interested. Uncharted 2, Among Thieves! We certainly are Among Thieves! Thieves of Tomb Raider, Thieves of Indiana Jones, oh snap! In all seriousness, there's multiplayer now, and the possibility of having to put up with more than one wisecracking Nathan Drake is officially my new vision of hell. Beatles Rock Band! Now that's what I call redundant. It's like saying Badger Mammal, or Inspector Morse Detective, or Harmonic's Obvious Cash-In. Alan Wake! Ironically, waking will be the exact opposite of what this game will make you do. Sonic All-Stars Racing! First thought, why the fuck does Sonic the Hedgehog need a car? Second thought, why the fuck does Sonic the Hedgehog need to still exist? Final Fantasy XIV! I feel that anything I could say would be repeating myself, so I'm just going to express my feelings with a strangled noise from the back of my throat. <laughs> Halo Reach, as in, if anyone thinks a new Halo game would be the slightest bit worth a damn, that certainly would be a reach. Bayonetta, more like, hey yo better not play this game, oh fuck you! Silent Hill Shattered Memories! Oh right, so it's a whole new interpretation of the concept with retooled gameplay and an emphasis on psychological horror. Actually, that sounds pretty good, but I'm committed to this idea now, so it's probably going to be bad. Why? Because people are shit. Whenever I'm in a crowd, I think to myself, who left this shit all over the place? I'm shit, you're shit, the world is shit. And if you're sitting there thinking, yes, it's true, everyone is shit except me, then you're a double bacon shit with large fries, Mr. Shitface. Sorry, this reflects badly on me, doesn't it? I should have said, Mr. or Mrs. Shitface. Water passes under the bridge, and with the new generation of consoles, I find myself in a strange position of being unreservedly on your side, Nintendo. And why? Because you released a game console. Not an inferior gaming PC for people who dream of being the sub in an unhealthy technomasochistic fantasy. The Wii U is all like, here are some things happening that even the most paralytically drunk mind can understand, assemble some friends in tequila shots, and let's do this, bitch. Consoles attempting the shift to online multiplayer focus will be remembered as one of the bigger of their many mistakes, because it's always an uphill struggle, and PCs do it so effortlessly. Play online without subscription fees, type insults with your keyboard, minimise the game and file your tax return and have another martini Mr Bond. Bam. PC doesn't do so well with local multiplayer because a PC is something you keep in an office and you don't entertain friends in an office except when you're shagging your secretary. You entertain friends in a living room, and that's where the console has the home team advantage. While Sony and Microsoft compete to see who can make themselves obsolete the fastest, Nintendo never lost sight of the need for strong local multiplayer in a console, and I respect that. So what is the problem with the Wii U? Well, to coin a phrase, you can make yourself as fertile as you like but you can't make a baby without a few good hard dick Kings, and people just aren't making games for the thing. Nintendo's never been good with third-party relationships. That's cool, I have trouble making friends as well, but that's because I compulsively slap people who end their sentences with prepositions. Nintendo loses friends by pushing the hardware. Everyone does hardware gimmicks, the X-Bone has the Kinect and the piss paw has its rectangular clitoris, but both of these are fairly easily ignored, like a sparrow perched on top of your hat. Wii U games push the screen controller like a sparrow getting in your face and doing plop plops on your kebab. The screen controller was always innovation for innovation's sake and doesn't seem to have done much more than place the Wii U in a dead zone somewhere between game consoles and tablet devices without the excitement of the former or the expedience of the latter. Press one button on a tablet and touch an icon or two and you are playing a game, my friend. You don't have to go through that slightly creepy Michael York at the end of Logan's Run calling down to the brainwashed masses sequence you get when you turn on the Wii U, and then you can minimise the game to file your tax return. It could be that the average Joe scumfuck is now tech literate enough that we no longer need a baby's first console to slowly and patiently introduce to the dum-dums all the wonders of the magic glowing box. Perhaps the very thing that makes me respect the Wii U is the very thing that's failing it. Maybe audiences would 
would prefer to game now on integrated devices that also play movies and music and has the all-important tax return factor, and a dedicated games machine may already be right up there with still having a landline phone in your house or a hand-cranked brontosaurus feeder. The difficulty is that Nintendo's name is so closely tied to dedicated games machines that you wouldn't take anything else they did seriously. In the mind of the masses, the new smartphone from Nintendo sounds akin to the new washing machine from Etch-a-Sketch. At this point I imagine a cute little finger puppet on the end of one of EA's many slick black tentacles hovering earnestly behind my shoulder. No, it's alright, it will be fun! You can play alongside other people and what a jolly lot of fun you'll all have! Okay. So on a desolate plot of land I place the foundations for the emerging city of Dogbollock, USA. Oh no no no! went the little finger puppet, leaning over and typing a row of asterisks. Can't call your city that, that would be ever so beastly! Why not? It is a fun name. I would be having more fun as the mayor of a city called Dogbollock. I'm hoping to set up a department of Dogbollock beautification. Oh, but other players will see it. A small innocent child might see it and suddenly know that bollocks exist. This online play makes things more fun assertion has sort of fallen at the first hurdle, hasn't it? So what benefit is there to being next to other cities that other people are running? Well, if they've got an excess of facilities, you can buy some of them. Choo-choo, all aboard the fun train. Suppose we should be grateful they didn't charge fucking micropayments for it. Buying facilities from other cities was a SimCity 3000 feature, so maybe being able to do it between player cities is a natural development. I wouldn't say it was worth dicking the entire user base for. Oh, but who doesn't have a constant internet connection these days? Poor people who can only fantasize about holding a position of power and influence. Why would they want to play a god game? I'll say this for EA, they are full of innovative ideas. As we just discussed, they have innovative new ideas on what the word fun means. And they're breaking new ground with the definition of sequel, too. I always thought it meant game with more stuff in it, but that just shows how archaic my thinking is. The area given for each city seems a bit small, which I suspect may be intended to incentivize sharing facilities with your neighbors, which I think is one of the ways HIV can get transmitted. You also can't edit the terrain before founding the city like you could in SimCity 4, and you can't import characters from The Sims anymore either. So tell me, little finger puppet, assuming that multiplayer elements are about as enticing to me as the sight of a dog sniffing another dog's bum, an easy thing to assume because they are, are there any new features SimCity can offer me? Well, there's a poo map. I beg your pardon? We've got a special map that lets you see all the poo! Forming in big piles under people's houses. Then you can build an outlet pipe and watch all the poo speed away on a wee wee one way system. Fucking sold! Hypemongers will tell you that if you can't release a game trailer in which something explodes every 0.3 seconds then you might as well throw yourself under a bus now. My non-gaming friends often say to me, Hey, we'd really like to play the best video games, which of the next-gen consoles do you think we should buy? To which I reply, Why did you just make two completely unrelated statements? That was like saying, I want to join the Russian ballet, what colour should I paint my ass?" Or, I'd like to visit Morocco, how many times should I stick my head in a Corby trouser press? You want to play the best video games, you buy a PC, or at a pinch borrow a PS2 from a time traveller. Cod Ghosts. Not only is it not a game about the vengeful spirits hanging around English chip shops, but it's also not the game it purports to be in its own intro sequence. The Ghosts, as the name might imply, are ostensibly a legendary stealth unit that specialises in taking down larger forces through sneaky guerrilla tactics. So obviously one of the first things you do in the game is ram raids an enemy base in a burning truck and start gunning down every living thing from the dandelions on upwards. Yeah, that's some good ghost in there, lads. Truly thou art akin to the flicker of a candlelight shadow as you waddle around an open field being shot at from 19 different directions. The other thing I gathered ahead of time was that the plot would be about a weak weakened US fighting a superior foe, which would make a nice change from the usual case wherein the heroes jump all over vastly inferior foes for floating the idea that maybe the US could stop eating all the pancakes for five minutes. So here's the sitch, the US has been invaded by all of South America. Okay, gonna have to stop you there, Call of Duty Ghosts. I get that all of your plots are birthed from the fantasies crossing the mind of a paranoid xenophobic fuckwit as he has violent grunting sex with a pile of damp moss, but at least he used to stick to foreigners who potentially are enemies of the US, and South America has better things to do with its time than sit around shaking its fist at your freedoms all day. At least as long as association football exists. Anyway, they attack America by hijacking America's orbital missile weapon. Okay, gonna stop you there again, ghosts. Firstly, so much for the enemy being superior if they can't make their own super weapons and gotta pinch them like safari park baboons nicking the windscreen wipers. And secondly, orbital fucking missile weapon? This invasion is sounding more justifiable by the second, because not only is the US outsourcing their weapons development to fucking Megatron, but they also appear to have exterminated every single member of their population who isn't a burly white dude. Just for fun, I kept a running tally of all the characters in the story campaign who aren't burly white dudes and you are under no obligation to shoot. The final total was three. A female astronaut at the start who immediately dies, one helicopter that spoke with a woman's voice, and a black member of the Ghosts unit who immediately dies. And frankly, when that happened, the main characters displayed less emotion than when their dog got shot. Damn it, the black guy died, they seem to say. Now we can't claim to have tons of black friends while arguing on the internet. The prison camp represents the entirety of Ground Zeroes. I should probably promise to stop harping on about the length issue, except I won't. I'm gonna harp like an angel with Parkinson's disease. So I guess what I'm saying is that all women are evil, bewitching innocents with their insidious emotions and absorbing our manhoods into their rank, blood-streaked spam sandwiches. Who needs them? Incidentally, I'm still not gay. 
The turning point came when I was invaded, but the attacker bowed upon seeing me, a gesture of recognition to mark a duel between equals. You know what, I thought, maybe I don't need to be so afraid of people all the time. So while he was bowing, I ran up and stuck my halberd up his ass. <laughs> You know me, I hate a series that meanders infinitely on like a hamster in a Mobius strip. So I was running out of patience for Assassin's Creed. What the hell are you doing putting another fucking one out? I'd have thought after three was like watching a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special intercut with scenes from a very boring documentary about knives. You'd have the sense to consider winding this shit up. Sorry, replied Assassin's Creed. Would an exciting pirate adventure on the high seas help you stomach our distasteful attitude? Yes, you fucking pricks. I remember when South Park first became a thing. The Simpsons had already advanced animation from Josie and the Pussycats to the point that it could say, hey, maybe your parents actually are still having sex. But it was South Park that went a bit further and declared, hey, maybe they're having sex with pigs and handfuls of their own shit and, I don't know, velociraptors. Someone has to be pushing at the boundaries because otherwise we wouldn't know where the boundaries were. We'd just be huddled in the middle of the prison exercise yard swapping WWE stickers. But I haven't watched South Park in quite a while. Nothing specifically made me go, never watching that show again. My wife's a velociraptor. Interest just kind of dwindled. I think because you can only transgress taboo for so long. It was like a giant orange space hippo from Mars descended from the sky and started dancing about on top of a hill playing bagpipes, and at first we flocked to see the giant orange space hippo, but after a while you realise he only knows how to play Scotland the Brave, and all his jumping about is shaking your fillings loose. So these days I just occasionally notice him as I glance out the window and think, is he still playing them fucking bagpipes? So South Park the stick of truth in this analogy is like the giant orange space hippo is still dancing about playing bagpipes, but now he's hired a zebra to sit at his feet and read poetry, so I've come out just to maybe see where the two of them are going with all this. Now I've put off reviewing the game for quite a while, and indeed I'm continuing to put off reviewing it in the review itself, because you can't really take the piss out of something that is itself taking the piss. This isn't a fucking bucket chain. Nor can one be crass about something that's already deliberately crass. It's like trying to embarrass a poo by making it wear another little poo as a hat. The only recourse left to me then is to be completely humorless and straight-faced about it. South Park The Stick of Truth is a role-playing game set in the titular cartoon town and enjoys the benefit of having been made by the original creators of the series, thus elevating it far above all previous attempts at South Park video game tie-ins which were like having your head forced into the tortured vagina of a person you used to respect. <laughs> More layers of bureaucracy are added to the process over time. Passports, permission to travel, permission to work, permission to piss, permission to use run-on sentences, until immigrants are handing you entire scrapbooking projects, and if they spell their name with a different vowel just once, then it's off to talk to the nice men with guns, in the building that people go into a lot but don't seem to come out of so much. But you get paid by how many you process in a day, so it's hard to sympathise when you had to put Spotty McBumble fuck through the x-ray machine because his passport says he's a girl, and the last precious seconds in the day trickle out as you examine a picture of his hairy balls. Hey, you know who'd love to see your hairy balls? These Nice men with guns. Listen to me, EA. Not every introvert is longing for the day that Zooey fucking Deschanel kicks their door down and forcibly drags them to a roller rink. I know how to have fun. It involves feeling like I achieved something with a sense of independence. It does not involve gangs of punks from some asshole's gambling town coming over to kick all my bus stops over. Can I suggest that perhaps you only ever hear from people who like online features because such people are extroverts? And it is only extroverts who think anyone gives a shit about their stupid opinions. And before you say anything, my opinions are actually very clever. The fact is, his role in the game is just another momentary gameplay gimmick. It would have been nice if he'd had some kind of personality besides being just another piece of military hardware for the armchair generals to masturbate over, although the same could be said of the human characters. Speaking of hardware, there are the standard apocalyptic coffee break sequences where you pull a remote control from the arse dimension and rain predator drone death down upon an enemy unable to in any way defend themselves or fight back. And you know what? I don't see how I'm supposed to have any grasp of the relative enemy threat when we may or may not be packing armfuls of super weapons we forgot to mention. Like after the enemy base ram raid, I'm told to pick off the stragglers with the robot's Sniper. Hold on a second, when did we set up a fucking robot sniper? What did we bring it here in? How did we set it up without the enemy noticing? Did we disguise it as a badger watching station? Incidentally, the ghosts are well fucking equipped for a guerrilla unit. Oh no, America has been attacked and is weakened and there's no defences except an inexhaustible supply of tank battalions and an army of killer robots. And we would have had a doomsday satellite if the rest of the world hadn't gotten all weird about it, which they were entirely right to be because when the player wrestles control of the satellite back at the end, they immediately use it to wipe hundreds of thinking feeling blips off the map as casually as one would use a windscreen wiper on a rainy day. Yet again, it seems like they cut out every moment in the story that could have built context but didn't have any explosions in it, and if they hadn't added voiced plot dumps to the loading screens, the experience would have been as coherent as scrambled porn intercut with the fantasies of Tea Party members. And fantasy really is the word. The vehicles all handle like turbo-boosted magic carpets, lest anything requiring actual skill get in the way of your unpleasant paranoid battle glory daydream so divorced from reality they might as well be taking place in fucking Narnia. So however you might have expected a game called Ghosts to differ from the modern shooter routine of meaningless violence and empty spectacle, you were wrong, you idiot. But somehow it's only getting worse. Black Ops 2 actually came across as at least slightly self-aware, and Modern Warfare 1 went so far as being profound, such as in that bit where you die slowly and horribly in a nuclear blast. If that happened in COD Ghost, you'd probably just fart all the radiation out in one big heroic guff, pull the broken glass out of your eyeballs, and then use it to shiv the Ayatollah. 
So the first game I played was Starbound, also known as Terraria, never heard of it, and also we're sci-fi and therefore different to the thing we haven't heard of. Although Terraria itself was also known as Minecraft, never heard of it, and also we're 2D and therefore different to the thing we've never heard of. So, you know, join the fucking conga line. Fans of The Last of Us, I feel a wedge has been driven between you and I. I know you were afraid that The Last of Us was some kind of beached whale that would die if not continually moistened by everybody's tongues, but it's not easy for me either, having a contentious opinion. When The Last of Us started losing me, I wasn't rubbing my fingerless gloved hands in glee, I was thinking, ugh, I am gonna get some real fucking stimulating email over this, aren't I? I feel some kind of bonding exercise would help clear the air, and what would be better than a hunting expedition, so please, load up your shotguns, join me around this barrel, and let's take it out on some motherfucking fish. This is how I unwind after stressful times, I review a game that absolutely no one expected to be good, and which entirely meets those expectations, namely Ride to Hell Retribution 1%. If you're wondering, the 1% is an outlaw biker gang thing, referring to a statement once made that 99% of motorbike riders are law-abiding citizens. It does not mean that the bikers have all gotten rich from trading stock in the knife-fighting industry. Yes, it's a biker-themed action-adventure melee shooty ridey bikey affair, sort of like Full Throttle if it had absolutely zero self-awareness, and if all the horrible action minigames had grown and taken over everything else like an inoperable cancer. After returning from Vietnam, responsible mullet owner Jake Conway finds his brother and uncle being terrorised by an evil biker gang with more influence and manpower than the fucking postal service. His brother winds up dead and Jake must emasculate his way through the ranks of the evil gang, racing and shooting and pipe-wrenching and shagging all their birds in what a 13-year-old boy who spent the last 72 hours locked in a storage space with a bunch of 80s action movies and an entire palette of Cocoa Pops would consider the apex of masculinity. What I'm noticing is that from number three onwards, Assassin's Creed has a tendency to introduce the main character and the assassin order and then let that whole side of the plot go back to bed so the game can party it up with historical figures and reenact famous events with the main plot occasionally popping its head round the door to complain about the noise. Although if we're more about the history now, Assassin's Creed 4 has picked a much better setting than its predecessor, so instead of desperately trying to convince us that it's exciting to throw tea into a harbour or watch some old men signing pieces of paper, we instead get to watch Blackbeard signing pieces of paper. Except his pen is actually a massive cannon and the piece of paper is actually the hope anyone in the near vicinity had of getting a good night's sleep. Viewer, there lies a world outside this grimy basement, the world of PC gaming, and all you have to do to experience it is come up the stairs and into the light, feel the rays of the sun and the cool breeze upon your skin, then go down some more stairs into the other grimy basement next door. But the story as competent as murder mystery goes, you're wrong-footed by obvious suspects, events recontextualise as the facts unfold, and some people get murdered in it, which I always think is crucial to the genre, and the supernatural elements throw a few curveballs but at least remain internally consistent, unlike the fact that a man who wears a fedora and vest somehow managed to convince someone to marry him without choking on their own vomit during the vows. Well I never said I wasn't a hypocrite. As a child, I would gaze enviously at my friends with Nintendo and Sega consoles who needed only plug the cartridge in and be killing brain cells within seconds. I had a Commodore 64, and gaming on such things hinged on being able to confidently state that you will be equally keen to play Fantasy World Dizzy about half an hour from now. I remember thinking that while you can't use a console to write a letter or print the words sausage slaps all over the screen in varying colours, consoles were clearly the platform of choice for those who wanted simply to game without faff and nonsense. I found myself thinking about those days as I attempted to play Rise on the Xbox One, or as I have come to call it, the Xbox installing, and had to to wait until it had finished faffing up and down the garden path, I put the disc in and up comes an exciting next-gen percentage that takes five sodding minutes to get to 1%. Don't worry, you don't have to wait till it gets to 100% before you can start playing. Okay, so what percentage do I have to wait for? I'm not telling you! Eventually the console let me pass the velvet rope like a disinterested theme park attendant and I found that my patience had earned me the privilege of watching an in-game progress bar instead. Oh well, at least all this installing means I won't have to faff about with the disc in future, I said aloud, as the Xbox coughed awkwardly and directed its gaze elsewhere. Watch Dogs isn't an easy game to summarise, the elevator pitch must have been delivered during a massive power outage. I suppose you could refer to it as Assassin's Creed in the future, might as well, it's got about the same amount of stabbing as Assassin's Creed does these days. Main difference is that instead of using rooftop vantage points to plan ahead, you use security cameras, and I'd say that's where the game comes into its own, when you learn to think outside the little bland cardboard cutout of a man we have been insolently asked to identify with, and turn the environment to your advantage, creating distractions and blowing up people who come to look at them, which never stops being funny. Gosh, I'm curious about that dog barking Sound. Gosh, I'm curious as to where my legs landed. Aliens Colonial Marines. What more need be said about this trough of walrus cankers? One couldn't find a more fitting use for the word alien. It alienated players by being drab and awful. It alienated fans of the franchise by fucking up the canon. It alienated its own aliens, ironically, by buggering up their AI. And for an encore, it alienated whoever was left over by lying in its gameplay trailers. Should have saved time and just alienated all their money into a big fire. Assassin's Creed is not a series of individual games anymore. Assassin's Creed is a fucking line graph. The line went down a bit for Assassin's Creed 3, but now it's gone back up again and maybe it'll keep going up in the next one, or maybe it'll take another plunge. What I do know is that this line graph is being drawn on what appears to be a very depressingly long piece of paper, at the end of which stands Ubisoft, and I do not like the look of that stapler it's holding. 
Hi, people who watch after the credits. The Escapist is up for a People's Choice Webby Award for games-related website voted on by the general public. I think you know what you have to do now. Annex the Sudetenland. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong. I meant vote for us. Then annex the Sudetenland. If you've loved Half-Life 2 and all its runty children so far, then you'll love this instalment because it's pretty much more of the same. If you like blazing action, peppered with variety and cleverness, you could do a hell of a lot worse than Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Manchester United nil. Now then, Team Fortress 2. Liverpool 3. Sorry, I'll stop this now. I suppose the pertinent question is what was so bloody demanding about the game that only a next-gen console could contain its mightiness? Well, the environments are pretty, although the actual level design is insipid, and if you're gonna shepherd us around with invisible walls, then at least be consistent about it. Some ledge is the same height as Marius he's content to pull himself onto, in full armour no less, he must have four arms like whale testicles, whereas at other times I got to watch Marius angrily hopping up and down next to an impassable chain that came up to his fucking shin, his dignified little miniskirt billowing with each hop, and dull level design meant I was constantly getting turned around and going back the way I'd came, especially if I'd had to fight a few dudes and watched pre-animated takedowns five or six more times so that the camera had been sweeping all over the place and keeping track of which way was north was like trying to keep track of which cup the ball was in during a Matrix fight scene on a merry-go-round. But yeah, I'd say the environments are pretty. Oh shit, I forgot. Ten out of ten. I really started loathing the tailing missions, especially when you have to stay close to your target without being noticed by them or any guards. So with one hand the game is your mother, pushing you out of your hiding spot to show everyone that funny little dance you learned, and with the other hand it is your father, beating you over the head with a chair leg because you made the mistake of being noticed before he'd had his morning drink. And the mere act of moving in Assassin's Creed sometimes feels like kicking a sack of potatoes around a cattle grid, and sometimes you think you're gonna hop onto a ledge and into a convenient bush, but Edward would rather grandly leap forwards, drop three stories and parkour roll into the people you're trying to tail, stopping just short of making jazz hands and going Going, Ta -da! Skyrim has that pleasant water cooler quality where every person you discuss it with has a different experience, but after a while the conversation will turn into a glitch swapping party. My best one was an old lady hovering 20 feet in the air before disappearing into the ground before my eyes. I never even knew her name, but I will always remember you, hovering ground lady. <laughs> Yes, I am quite bitter because I had to install Origin to play SimCity. EA's overpriced, I'm going to make my own clubhouse just for all my friends and it's going to have cake and subutio and it's going to be so much better digital distribution system. And putting that on my computer felt like leaving a child of my own in the Jonestown daycare centre. I felt dirty afterwards, I had to take a steam bath. That's why you load up steam and download a bunch of indie games to scrub yourself with. I thought modern military shooters were bad a year ago, but it turns out we were still merely poised on the diving board above the frozen shit. Even Black Ops 2 now seems comparatively self-aware, alongside something like Call of Duty Ghosts, an experience coldly designed to appeal to the worst instincts of a sad majority of unpleasant fucks. I'm not sure the genre could get any lower, but I've been wrong before. Maybe next year we can look forward to a game in which we stop all terrorism in the world by releasing a deadly virus that only targets people who aren't three quarters white and one quarter bald eagle. And one last unfixed thing worth noting is that Wind Waker's economy is fucked. You get 30 bombs and 30 arrows right off the bat, and every other enemy drops item refill pinatas, so you never run low on anything. And then there's potions. If you bring a bunch of snot dribbles harvested from dead slimes to the potion man, you can get a potion that restores health or magic or health and magic if you hunt the very rare blue slime because you're mad. Or you could go to your nan, who will give you two potions that restore health and magic and double your damage for free. And you needn't so much as exchange nods with the slime for it. Nan, your hearty soup is flooding the potion market. Fuck Ganondorf, we need to save you from getting your kneecaps broke by the fucking Potion Teamsters Union. Or, or, fuck potions and get by on heart pickups that constantly rain from the enemies like the organ donor van exploded. So that's not fixed, but then I suppose there's a limit to what the remake can fix before it stops feeling like Wind Waker, and for what it's worth, this is Wind Waker. Same game, same recessive potion industry, same repetitive fucking music, and it's good, because it's Wind Waker, and Wind Waker was good. That's about the final word. Except for this one, Minge Gurgle. <laughs>